have lights out and have to take off. Just a little light. Hello. Hi, we're going to get started. Uh, good evening, and thank you all for joining me today for the annual Michael Owen Jones Endowed Memorial Lecture. Michael graduated from the University of Virginia School of Architecture in 1985. He was a talented and enthusiastic designer who passed away in 1991, only three years after moving to New York to begin his career as an architect. Today, we continue to celebrate Michael's deep personal investments to the architectural and educational field through this lecture series. It is a series that stands apart from all others in that it is completely student nominated and student organized. Graciously endowed by Michael's family and friends, this is an opportunity for us as the student body to take initiative over our own education and decisively agree upon those who inspire us. We are greatly indebted to the memory of Michael and although his friends and family cannot join us today, their presence is felt and their generosity is most appreciated. This lectureship is an honor and an event continuously esteemed by students and faculty as we've continued to invite inspiring and emerging design professionals to Charlottesville. As chair of the Michael Owen Jones Lecture Committee, I'm especially excited to introduce this year's lecture, Rosana Montiel. One main criterion in choosing a lecture for the Michael Owen Jones series is the relevance as a designer. Rosana's work is applicable not only because of her role as one of the leading architects practicing in Mexico, but in the scope and nature of her investigations that challenge all aspects of the architectural discipline. As founder and director of Rosana Montiel Estudio de Arquitectura, Rosana's works across both built projects and design research. Particular attention in her work is given to urban rehabilitation and low cost interventions that sensitively engage with the local community. In many of her projects, walls act as vectors that connect rather than boundaries that divide. This attention to boundaries and their structuring of social relations is particularly strong in Rosana's work. Her focus on designing processes rather than objects and her interest in place could be attributed to her training as both an architect and a planner. Rosana's practice demonstrates what is possible today as we continue to expand modes of practice while discovering and rediscovering ways to think about architecture and its potential to matter in the world. Just this past year, Rosana participated in the, in the 2018 Venice Biniale Free Space with Stand Ground Installation and she had a book titled HU, Common Spaces and Housing Units. Rosana has received numerous awards, including the MCHAP Emerging Architecture Prize for her project Common Unity, the Miami Arc Marathon Award, the Moira Gilmill given by the Architectural Review in London, and the Architectural League of New York's Emerging Voices Awards. And these are just to name a few. So um, we are thrilled to have her with us today. So please join me in welcoming our honored guest, Rosana Montiel. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Um, I would like to thank um, all the students committee and especially Samantha for inviting me to Yuva to present my work. Um, I'm really happy to be here and spend two days um, knowing more about your university, your methodology and everything you do here. So thank you, gracias. So let's see if you hear me well. I think I have two microphones. Okay. So this is Mexico City, the fourth largest mega city in the world with 21 million people. It is home to a multiplicity of cities, an immense mass of hard surface that seems to extend endlessly with undefined boundaries. This is the place where I live, where I work, one of the places I design for. Expected growth worldwide will take place in urban centers. The world will be shaped by these territories of contrast. By the way, this is not a Photoshop, but reality. 
So Mexico City is a place of incredible energy and invention, a place of opportunities, informality, and chaos that constantly allows serendipity to happen. It is a place to look closer, to imagine, to act. My studio has focused on architectural design, um, artistic resignification of space, and the public domain. Exploring new schemes to represent space is an exercise in critical thinking the studio often goes through. Our interpretation of a project is inseparable from its representation. Our method has a multi-sensory understanding of space, so we often experiment with new kinds of materials or resignify common elements by placing the accent on different formal approaches and building systems. And we achieve this by researching the layers involved in a project. We constantly redraw because it is a way of looking closer at the real, of picking up details that are crucial in transforming reality. This is why I, what I consider my main task and contribution to architecture, transforming space into place. Placemaking is a powerful approach to spatial production that enhances quality and of life and interconnects people. Placemaking is not a design product, but a designing process. So in what follows, I will show you my projects following seven principles or seven points of a manifesto. The project really interconnect all seven points, but I choose to organize them according to their more prominent aspects. Seek content in context. Before designing, we analyze the potential, resources, and essential needs of the place. Hire locally, source regionally. Work with the community, not just for it. Engaging people not as consumers of space, but as placemakers. Restore citizens to cities. The first project I'm going to show you, it's called Boy Temple. Placemaking is about building processes which enable meaningful connections between spaces and people. But even more so, I would say placemaking is recognizing that meaningful connections lay the ground for any building process. This should be the first assumed context for architecture's content development. Boyd Temple, done in collaboration with Derek Delacamp, is one of the seven landmarks in the landscape along the route of a 200-year-old pilgrimage which annually goes across the western highlands of Mexico. Approximately one million people travel by foot 117 kilometers around springtime. The white concrete wall forming a 40 meter diameter circle which we designed is a piece placed amidst pine woods that blend in with the particular topography of the site. It informs its content with the context of a natural haven respecting the terrain slopes and elevations. At some points suspended three meters high, at others buried to respect horizontality. But its essential feature is to be an open boundary, an austere tectonic gesture in the landscape that marks more than a site or territory. It is an expression of timeless space. Boyd Temple includes the macrocosmos in the microcosmos. As an architect, I am careful that the effect of what we design leads to connectedness and integration. When architecture tasks takes for granted the social ground which makes it happen, it forget its vital effect that it is to build relationships. So rela relationships are the primary shelter of any society. Without them, proper shelter cannot exist. This next project is called Rooftop Court. Sometimes our approach is not seeking content in context, but actually creating a new context through our content. In recent years, I have worked on many projects for the rehabilitation of public space and common areas in social housing units in collaboration with Infonavit. So Infonavit is the institution of the National Fund of Workers um, Housing. These are samples of the type of social housing complexes that have been developed nationwide in Mexico for the past 20 years. The consequences have been terrible. Although 70% of what gets built in Mexico is housing, around 50 to 20% is regularly abandoned. Developments result in lifeless dormitory blocks whose social depression factors significantly in the real estate value of property. 
In developments such as these, which evoke post-urban non-places of contextless context, the content we design creates frames for the rehabilitation of cultural context. By activating public space effectively in housing blocks, we would be enabling a grassroots culture to emerge and shape community. But our greatest barrier has been convincing major stakeholders in the production of housing to invest in public space and social infrastructure. In this suburban town, townhouse complex near the Gulf of Mexico, where more than 25,000 people will live, the developer literally ask us to build a rooftop to protect a basketball courtyard from the sun, heat, and rain. So the, the developer gave us just this place, and he said, we just need a roof. And so we gave them more than a roof. We gave them this. So realizing the lack of public space, we proposed more than a rooftop. We designed a portico agora that fulfilled the program of a community center using the exact same space and little more than the original budget. The Portico Agora created a new habitat through vegetation and expanded the user's programs by the way of height and inter-column capacity. In between the columns, we inserted a multifunctional program comprising swings, hammocks, library, computer room, restrooms, forum, playground. When the developer realized the positive social impact that the place had on his social housing venture, he invited a biologist working in the natural reserve nearby to set up a herbal medicinal clinic with a small botanical garden where the community would be taught the benefits of local medicinal plants. The healing effect of the project was immediate. We went from the contextlessness created by the generic urban sprawl of a cultural desert to a hub for ecological awareness and biodiversity preservation solely by designing a program which sustains a vision of place. The second point of the manifesto, change barriers into boundaries. We replace barriers for boundaries. A boundary is a permeable membrane that generates parity between private and public space, encourages social interaction and exchange. People will feel safer and more at home in places of open communication than in spaces of garrison fear. fears. Work with people to help them voice their hopes, needs, and aspirations to overcome barriers. Common unity. In Mexico City, housing complexes are massive. 25% of the Mexican population lives in housing units. They are cities in their own right. Common Unity was an intervention we did also within Fonavit in collaboration with the architect Alin Wallach in the San Pablo house, uh, Jalpa housing unit, located in the industrialized nor northern part of Mexico City, where more than 7,000 people live. When we arrived to Jalpa, we founded a partitioning housing unit. Zoning and access had been altered through walls, fences, and barriers mounted by residents. The gated sectors fragmented Halpa's landscape into passageways and corridors that push locals, that push social life out of common areas. Fences had become a barrier to habitability. In some, public space was privatized, underused, or inexistent. Halpa had no free space for civic life. Walls, fences, and barriers, however, were untouchable as they had in fact solved the internal security of the unit. So we work around the barriers created by the residents in order to make them permeable, democratic, and meaningful. We engage the community through several side actions and workshops. We transform the sectors of the unit into barriers, what we termed common unity. One of our design strategies to free private spaces for public use was to shift the vertical railing, walls, gates, enclosures, which separate and divide for the horizontal, roof, shelter, floor patterns that connects, reunites, and encourages community interaction. This is how we found it, and we transformed the space into this. The horizontal became more than just a roof. The shelter common areas we designed expanded the program of potential activities through compact multifunctional structures or kits that cater 
to all age groups from the club. We develop integral, low-cost improvement of public space by resignifying simple materials. The place can be experienced today as a system of courtyards. The flexible boundaries made the common areas more than a front yard or a park because they're private and public at the same time. Design spoke for itself in common unity. People willingly gave up 90% of the barriers. Trust was the touchstone for change. In Jalpa, we also recycle extant spaces for, for, for cultural activity. There was an old leaky shed called El Saloncito that was already in use as a multi-purpose room for school tutoring, knitting clubs, and religious instruction. Our intervention brought out all this, its potential. A totally different space emerged in the same place. We kept the exact same area of the old one, but the use of natural materials, open visuals, and light transformed it into a welcoming place. A bookstore donated an important collection of children books, and the Saloncito became a library. Then a telecom company gave access to free Wi-Fi, and the surrounding area became a work hub. We went from a gloomy shed to a sunny library study area. As of today, the place is filled with life and constant community activity. Neighbors take turns to sweep the fallen leaves instead of felling the trees. There are outdoor classes, teaching lessons, ceremonies, movie nights. The new space facilitated a different kind of ownership and appropriation, one that habituates inhabitants to work for the common good. Through placemaking, we built with the community, not only just for it. Our design substitute barriers for boundaries. So we um, did this installation at the Penis Biennale, taking out all these ideas of the manifesto and also like how to change barriers into boundaries. So in these years, ben Venice Biennale Free Space, our peace stand ground sustained a position of common ground, which invited people to imagine a process. Free space translates in Spanish to a play on words. It means set space free, liber espacio, and leeway for action, espacio libre. To our studio, free space is both the imperative to act and a space for action latent within the potential development of a place. We paved the exhibition floor with a one-to-one -one reproduction of the Arsenal wall. On the original wall, a screen projected in real time the activity of the public space behind the barrier. And this, as simple as it sounds, was incredibly hard to do it because filming public space impinges on issues of security and privacy. So in a way, we discovered how really hard it is to remove a wall, even that we were not filming, we were just projecting. Their interpretation of the wall as ground communicated public space with private space, but the exhibition area trans transgressed the prohibition of any muse museal space, which is please do not touch. The walkable wall floor promoted a tactile, haptic experience of space. On the one hand, stand ground opened up the exhibit space to the urban horizon, to the wonderful that is Venice, a city that conflates with the sea and open a fluid space which allowed playful communication. On the other hand, the mediatized nature of the piece, the projection on screen, that constructed the simulacra and illusions of freedom in our current society, which lives vicariously in virtual spaces under constant surveillance. Our next project, our next uh, point of the manifesto, shift perception. Interventions in the public domain designed to involve users of the space creatively and free of preconceived ideas transform the collective perception of a place. Be unafraid to transit from temporary tactics toward permanent strategies, structures, and pilot solutions. We often develop what we call site actions. They are very low cost interventions that involve the people with the space in a ludic, innovative way. Their purpose is to get people to voice their needs and aspirations. The added value of letting people represent their own space is they become aware of the worth of what they have. We develop new public spaces from the most ephemeral 
and determining tool in, archi in architectural design, the line. It explores and documents the potential of a line, uses a tool of spatial design to construct, deconstruct, work and rework, different perceptions of urban space. Out of line, one line, the labyrinth. Here, we simulated a built space with a line made of lime. We intervened a place called El Polvorín, which functioned as a pa passing site during weekdays and as a soccer court during the weekends. This site was a place without an established use, and its effect, not on purpose, was to divide two neighborhoods, that people never talked to each other, they were fighting all the time. So we decided to do this game, like just draw a um, labyrinth in the middle of, of this court. And the project aimed was to intervene the public space in an ephemeral way, with the intention to reactivate it in the imagination of both neighborhoods and the site's potential to integrate the two communities. The center became a, spa a space of dialogue and exchange. The conclusion of the exercise was that there are many ways to understand what it means to build, almost as many spaces as can be designed. A single line can rebuild the perception of the space, its costumes and habits, the place's memory, and most importantly, it can rebuild a community. Another of the side actions that we do, what that we did is um, a walk to the volcano in a community called Miravalle. A vision of place facilitates information and knowledge exchange to bring about significant social change. Sometimes all it takes is the experience of an alternative point of view. In collaboration funded by the Urban Exchanger Program in Berlin, we team up with the SMAC Berlin Studio to study solutions in tandem for two neighborhoods, both dormitory suburbs on the edge of their cities, and both with a complex social fabric, Miravalle in Mexico City and Hellesdorf in Berlin. The double reading of this small scale project has the potential to produce a ripple effect in the larger scale. We learned that going back to basics and understanding a site's own resources and essential needs can really make a change in the perception people have of their own place. In the case of Miravalle, it was water. In the case of Hellesdorf, it was light. I will explain what we did in Miravalle with, in more detail. In contrast from Hellesdorf, Miravalle lessons of resilience actually come from informality. It is a self-built, unplanned settlement, which nonetheless has a highly organized community. Despite the community's proximity to the Guadalupe Volcano, Miravalle had completely turned their back to the natural world. So the side action we planned was inviting the local people to take a walk up the volcano hill, which almost none of them have ever done it. The hide had an enormous social impact. For the first time, they said the community looked at their homes from the volcano perspective. The irony of this fact could not be any greater considering Miravalle literally means in Spanish, look at the valley. So change begins with a shift of perception. The paradox would be that resource awareness in the city could potentially be seeded first in informal settlements and passed on to formal architecture. But for this to take root as a valuable development strategy, we need as planners and designers to ship our perspe perspe perception of so-called slums and view them not as a problem, but as part of the solution. Approach the landscape as the problem. Derelict, underused, or disused urban space, when approached as topography, reveals its natural potential. Unclaimed urban spaces can become ecotones, places of resilience, inclusive and rich in function diversity. Recycling and resignifying extant infrastructure transform an urban scar or hostile border of the landscape into an attractive horizon. Biologically speaking, the ecotone is a transitional territory which modulates the tension arising between two distinct environments. In urban and architectural design, I understand the ecotone as a place that harmoniously merges the public and private sphere, tempers the move from open space to enclosures, and allows respectful coexistence of build-up and natural areas. The landscape becomes the program 
when architecture works systematically. By performing as infrastructure, architecture gives back to the public realm. Fresnillo Playground. This housing unit of 102 buildings located on the hot arid plains of Zacatecas in northern Mexico is one of the most violent ridden municipalities of the region. The housing unit is constantly hugged by members of organized crime, protecting their territorial influence from other cartels. So the social landscape is intrinsically violent. Besides the social scars inflicted upon the young people growing up in this unit setting the housing complex had a visible urban scar. A former open air sewage canal had been paved and what remained was a drive creek divided into two. So imagine you have this barrier and then nobody used this place then you cannot cross with uh, strollers or wheelchairs, but you cannot also go through this way in order to do something else. So when we came here, we said, well, we have to take out this barrier and change it into a new horizon, and we have to use these lobes when we saw that children uh, slide down the rain gutters. And we said, well, we have the perfect place to do a playground. And we saw it just by doing a deeper and, and looking closer into the landscape. So our main tactic was transforming this urban scar or hostile border of the landscape into an attractive horizon people will feel drawn to. We made universal accessible bridges that open an esplanade underneath and rebuild the canal slopes to make them work as a resting area, as agora steps, and as part of a playground program of climbing walls where rain gutters were resignified as slides, as I mentioned before. We also studied the local vegetation and planted certain species of grown trees on canal flanks to cool and shade the area. And we also used lines of color to suggest activities on the ground floor. In fact, the most dramatic change on the cityscape was affected from mere color. We changed the original shrill, aggressive colors that you can see in the image on the buildings to an earthen palette that made them more welcoming on the human scale and blended them better with the natural soils of the area. Residents felt like they have moved to a different place, not having moved at all. Color gave them a sense of fresh start and made them feel at home. When derelict, underused, or disused urban space is approached as a natural topography, an unclaimed characteristic of territory can, be, can become resignified as a place with character that renegotiates the social tensions of a given environment. Resignify materials. Textures and atmosphere are essential in creating a sense of place. Readings of vernacular or industrial materials, which become sensitive to notions of habitability through patterns, rhythms, colors, surfaces, and shapes, are an invitation not only to look closer, but to come closer together. Make the most out of each material. Incinerating stations. 
For instance, we recently designed and built the incinerating stations, which houses the furnaces for solid waste combustion in 17 Mexican national ports and airports. Our research for the prototype sought out the most functional form and construction material. We drew all the elements that had to be inside the station, added the incinerating station, and realized that a circular plan was the best way to do it. This enclosing spatial arrangement efficiently deployed the operator's program around the incinerating machine. Besides make, making tasks orderly, it radically transformed the way these facilities used to operate. Finding an adequate name for the project was integral to the conceptual design process. The term station evokes the repli replicability and tidiness of a space lab and the logistical movement around a train station. And we weren't that far off the mark because some of these stations actually seem to have landed in alien or post-apocalyptic landscapes. The main, the main challenge was that the client wanted ready-made parts as in a prefabricated home, which would adapt to a wide range of climates, a jungle, a desert. The walls and roofs of the station, in fact, can be set up in a couple of days. For this, we had to create a unique type of folded concrete that is durable, malleable, and requires nearly no maintenance. Although already made, the prototype was flexible enough to become adjusted and improve depending on site-specific conditions. So the station becomes an inhabitable machine that in its round arrangement not only houses an agreeable workspace but creates a meaningful relationship between the operator and his work. Talking about materials also, detailed care of materi materiality also meets with Congress the identity of a place. In this private weekend home in Tepoztlan, a two-hour drive away from Mexico City, we use local construction materials to modulate different environments throughout the house. The main challenge was given a sense of amplitude and variation in a rather small terrain, so that each space offers something singular. The place can be experienced as a grand terrace with a luscious garden. The boundaries between open spaces and en enclosures conflate. The house subtly appeals to the user's perception. The emphasis is in hues and textures. The vernacular stones in floors and walls not only project a sense of warmth, but also connect the house to the lands precolium being passed and the multiple layers of the Oaxacan territory. It is a modern contemporary house, but its timeless design nevertheless gives a sense of history and connectedness. It is a small house, but in program has five rooms and many spaces to be, with a patio and uh, access to the kitchen through, through the other side of the house. Its variety of atmospheres is achieved with different heights using large windows and sliding doors that not only contrast narrow and expanded areas, but also allow the coexistence of interior and exterior spaces maintaining visual depth. At times you cannot really tell if you're inside or outside. Room divisions in different combinations transform space into one or the other. Despite its austere design, the home's crafted combination of materials gives an air of fulfillment. All of the interior and exterior elements interweave into a harmonious whole that sustain a state of contemplation. <coughs> Materiality is not solely about form or function, but about place. Materials imprint meaning and nourish well-being to our daily habits work with temporality. 
special design that considers the passage of time and materials, the, the transformation of a place according to the needs of the user, chance as an everyday event, the use of space by groups of people throughout the day, all allow a resilient appropriation of space at different times. We often reflect on temporality with regards to built space. So as much as we explore the past and the present, we like the utopian exercise that launches into the future. Of course, reflecting on the future means thinking about time itself. This water table is our version of a modern oracle. It projects on its surface the patterns that result from different vibration algorithms. Through resonance, the table engages different bodies of water and bird sounds, including us and the Earth as a whole. As frequencies as expanded in water, it becomes apparent how the past will be what the future has been. Without water, there is no time. So the present is clearly the result of our echoes and projections about water as a source of life. This next project is called Metropolis. Constructing millions of homes far from city centers has generated a serious problem of inequality because of mobility. In Mexico City, people spend on average two to three hours daily in commuting and close to 30% of their income in transportation. The less money people have, the more time they give up. People throw away life getting places. Among Mexico City's greatest asset is its transit system. It services close to 70% of the population, so why not make the most out of it? This last project, as I told you, we call it Metropolis, and it recycles 22 buildings in 16 stations connected to the subway network. It enhances the urban transportation system as a network of networks. The iconic facade of these buildings makes them ideal for multi-service centers. Some of them are derelict or underused buildings. So we saw this, that informal commerce daily brings into subway wagons all kinds of products, from music to sewing kits. So would it be possible to fit in also a health clinic, a concert hall, a supermarket, or a sports center on a regular basis? Articulated, they, would, they could generate an underground loop of entertainment, art, sports, commerce, and health, in which the services meet the user transportation routines. So imagine that there are 22 buildings, and then they are connected by the transport system. I think that there's no place in the world where there, these buildings, that it's a network of networks, that you have them and you can do many things, they're underused or derelict. So, the idea is that we presented this to the government, that they were very enthusiastic, but it also happens that it's very difficult to do it. So the next step, we took it to an exhibition called Utopia. And what we did was that um, we, we play with the program of these buildings. And so each building recovers a historical sense of place from the subway station name where they are located. So the program's archaeology of the name interconnects the roots of our historic subsoil. The metro becomes a time machine that juxtaposes the scenes and flux of the city. Instead of utopias, we create alternate histories, a network of urban times and fictions. Despite negotiations that are on hold for the time being, we're still working on getting this project done because it's a big idea worth pursuing. So my recommendation to young architects and designers out there is to trust your own interests. Work with purpose, but leave enough room for chance to reward you. And most importantly, never lose the capacity of taking the initiative to propose solutions. Hold beauty as a basic right. Beautiful design is an investment in dignity. Regardless of budgetary constraints, beauty is affordable by a virtuous use of resources. Elegant solutions are intrinsic to the program. Buildings are infrastructure for new ecologies. 
approach every space with the same respect you have for sacred places. Aesthetic decisions can become infrastructure that changes people's lives. We have worked in a lot of community projects that have taught us to subvert the logic of architectural production and making small matter. This was a house we designed pro bono. This is the house we designed uh, pro bono and very fast for Reina, a single mother of two children where her house was very damaged with earthquakes of the past September 2017 in Mexico. There has been a lot of reconstruction in Mexico and groups like Piensa Sostenible, Think Sustainable, are doing more than 50 houses in Oquilan with different architects. So we went, when we went to visit Reina, she had all her things outside and couldn't believe she was going to have a new home. Here is um, Reina house and um, she had a very small plot and we occupied it all. So to have more area, we did an attic for her kids to sleep. And the house, um, this is the house, well, her house was here. And now this is what remains there. No, this is the house of the father. So we use all the plot to build the house. Our design recovers and re reinterprets the raised granary platform space and the external heart of the traditional rural house. The house achieves a thermal interior thanks to the use of eco block walls and wood. All the wooden elements are usually used for construction with scaffolding. Our mixed use design is economic but highly effective as it increases the value of the original property while improving the daily well being, social environment, and economic opportunities of the family as a whole. The house has been enormous, enormously popular. Many people that walk by praise it and take pictures of it. But I think one of the, the most important things that happened was here is Caleb, the son of Reina, that he's very proud of his home. He takes his shoes to go up to his room, saying to his mom, he will always take care of his new house. So how does a tiny house such as this make small matter? First, the plight of destruction and human misery framing its construction made us work really fast. Catastrophes are so demanding that their time frames offer our opportunity to work intuitively and efficiently. Second, we turn to local construction practices that had meaning and resonance within the family's context and adapted, and adapted them to maximum budgetary constraints and available materials. So this small home shows how traditional can be modern, vernacular can be innovative. And third, Small matters because it's a good way to prototype solutions in a model scale that can be taken to a larger scale. So finally, to conclude, I believe architecture now is positioned to sustain better living conditions. So mega cities like mine daily raise important questions. In a world of limited time and resources, what is absolutely urgent and necessary to design? What type of architecture can we sustain worldwide? How can we solve important issues with the minimum possible infrastructure? Thank you very much. Sure.
Well, I, I think that um, Mexico, as you have seen in the images, we have a, a lack of public space, of course, and but we have a lot of opportunities, as, as I said before. And these opportunities gives the, um, the, the possibility to go and work with space wherever you want to do it. You know, I think that what we have in Mexico is that we have opportunities and we don't have a very, I think that many Latin American places, and I think Felipe can, can also <laughs> say about that, that um, we don't have a lot of constraints or a lot of regulations that you have here. So many of the things that we do there, it, there, there will be impossible to do it here in that way. So I think that that for, for us is very important that so that we can develop a lot of things that you may never think that you can do it. And also I think that with very low budget, very few budget, you can also develop many things. And I think that um, as we lack a lot of public space in Mexico, I think that now um, more architects or more institutions are looking to public space. And um, this was the projects that I did were, were a great opportunity with Carlos Cedillo. He was at that time the director of um, the SEEDS. It's the Center for Sustainable Research. And um, for example, in Fonavit. In Fonavit before, this institution that I was telling that fund workers housing, it uh, started in like 1972. And when it started, they built a lot of, uh, of the housing units, and after they build it, then they give it, they give a fund for workers. But they stopped doing it, and like 20 years ago, the developers took out the, all these um, housing units, and that's when it began to cause a lot of problems. And then Carlos Edillo came like six years ago, and he started giving a lot of architects projects for rehabilitating public space and to, like, you know, like put attention to these issues. And I think that we are now starting to see it in a different way. And uh, we're starting to, many architects, to like push harder and further so that we can develop more of these public spaces and that we can have more public spaces in many communities. Did I answer your question or did? Um, I thought the presentation was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. I just moved here from having lived in Mexico for almost eight years. Really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Where, Mexico City? It, no, San Miguel de Allende. Okay. And um, I'm a landscape architect. I graduated from here uh, many years ago. Anyway, I was very... Um, uh, happy to see that there were some initiatives um, by a nonprofit in San Miguel in which they were developing very structurally very strong uh, earthen bricks using a recipe of uh, certain types of clays and lime and water um, that uh, and and they were of a unit size so it could be replicated. And I wondered about the materials that you might be using down there. You mentioned a block, and maybe it is that weekend home that you did. I'm not sure now, in which I thought, well, perhaps it might have been in that um, type of construction. So I'm interested in any of the materials that you may be aware of that are more sustainable uh, than perhaps the traditional ones. Yes, and we make this Oquilan house, the one for the earthquake, with echo block um, walls. And the echo block that they told us that they were giving these blocks, so we had to use them. So all the architects use this, um, they call it echo block. And they're made of earth also, no? Like they're made of earth and clay. And we even saw where they did it. And so it's really interesting to see like people go there and see how they build their blocks. 
and so they, after they, they're using them in their houses. So they have this relation of understanding where does this block come from. And I think that also we have, um, we did, um, we just finished a prototype made with bamboo also. So we're testing with different recycled materials. We did another, it's called one spare room, and we also use uh, for the roof um, polyaluminum, recycled polyaluminum. So we're testing and trying, you know, like these materials for like housing, for example, for Infonavit, you cannot use them until you prove that they will stay there for many, many years. But we are trying to experiment with new materials that can change the idea of the normal block, of the concrete block, in a way. And we're testing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Rosanna, for a great uh, lecture. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about some of the earlier projects in relation to public space. Uh, and it's less, it has less to do with the design process uh, and more with the management process of, uh, of those uh, uh, projects. And I was interested if the implementation of a new landscape strategy, of a new public space strategy, it also allows a way in for a longer term management strategy of the space and of the housing project. Uh, and if you have been involved in that part of the aspect, right? What is the afterlife of the public space? Mm -hmm. I think that that's a very good question. And in the morning I was talking with um, some of the students about that. And I said that for me, it's really, really important what happens after. And I think about what happens after is the way that you can learn more about the prototype of, or what you are doing, if it works or if it doesn't work. The, one of the main problems is that there's no money or no budget to do that. So I'm trying to say always, also always I, I said, Carlos, Carlos, you should pay not only for the project and not only seeing how it's built, but after, you know, like keep some money for after so that we can test and we can go and we can see what's happening and what's the afterlife of that space. But well, there's always, they always say that, yes, 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 but there's no money. But we, we I keep going, mostly, some of them are out of Mexico City, but Jalpara is in Mexico. I have been going like many, many times after. And um, it's been incredible talking to the people that live there. And for example, one of them, um, Cesar, he said, well, I went to live to Querétaro, so I wanted to sell my apartment. And in Jalpa, there were like many, many patios. We just um, rehabilitated four of them because there was only money for, for those. So the other ones are really mad that they want their uh, patios rehabilitated also. But he said that he sold his apartment in one week by the double. And that the, like, the other parts that were not rehabilitated, nobody wants to buy there any. And, um, and he said that also, like when you rent it, you're like now they have a university in front, La Guam. And now like there are a lot of students that want to stay there. And like if they used to pay 2000, for example, for one unit, now they pay 8000 because now there are four students staying there, each one paying 2000 but they want to live there. So uh, I think that Jalpa has been a very, very interesting um, project, more in the social construction, in the way that it has been a social construction, not only laying bricks. Because also, like people, as I said, before they didn't even know each other, they, now they go and sweep the floor. They take care. And how do you maintain it? That's one of the questions. No, but, but now people, because they feel proud of and they feel ownership, then they pay to maintain it. And they pay an amount. And they had made like um, contributions. They have made like um, meetings where before they didn't do it. And it has been really, really surprising that like the effect, the after effect has been really positive.
Hello. Uh, uh, thank you again for coming. Um, I had this question because, um, I mean, as a student, uh, later on in the future, I plan on working in, let's say, cities in the Middle East. And um, one thing that I've noticed is that although uh, in certain areas there, there are, I guess, not physical, uh, there actually are physical uh, barriers, but also just barriers created um, from cultural and social pressures um, between genders. So it's like, um, let's say like men and women, they can't be in a public space together. How would you address that as a designer working on a project, let's say somewhere in Saudi Arabia or Dubai? Well, I will have to start studying <laughs> their culture first. No? And uh, well, it's a difficult question to answer. Like I don't have the answer here at the moment, but I think that just to say, I think that it's for us at the office, it's very important, the research process. And um, I think that that will be the first phase to do, you know, like start doing research, try to understand, we do site actions in order to get uh, closer to people. And as I said before, it's working with them and not only just for them and like hearing what they need to say and what their needs are. But as an architect, I think that you have to go further and give them more. You know, and that, that's, that's our job to imagine and to be creative and to give them much more so that they can like, because they can imagine some, something, but once you understand their culture, how they live, their necessities, then you can give them much more. And that's where the architect enters and puts all its creative to help these people. Thank you. Hi. Oh. Hi. So um, thank you again. I wanted to ask a question also um, about your process in the office and especially related to the idea of participation a local engagement, because we've seen in some of the projects how you um, you were showing images of, of people engaging with the design process. So I wanted to uh, ask you about what's your approach to this um, to this theme of uh, of people engaging in design, and because because we know that sometimes that can become a double-edged sword at some point. So um, mm -hmm. what's your take on that? Well, I I think that it has been difficult in some cases in others it has been more easy but I think that we first did it very intuitively because for example in, in Halpa again when they in front of it told us okay you're gonna go to this place and do research and they gave like 10 different architects different places and they said but you cannot go in and you cannot say that you're gonna do something because we we're not sure we're gonna build it and it's really terrible when you go with somebody and you say, we're going to do this, and then you go and you never come back. So, um, and it happens a lot. So um, we said, well, how are we going to do our research if we cannot go in this site? It's impossible. And so we decided, as I, I said before, the, the university is in front of, of Halpa, and so we said, Let's go in as sociologists, not as architects, and let's just go and say that we're doing research. So we, we disguise ourselves as sociologists and went in there and tried to get all the information we could. And, you know, and when we presented, we had like this presentation that we had talked with all these women and all these people, and we were like getting to know them and knowing what they needed. And when the others presented, some of them said, well, as you said, well, you said that we couldn't go in, so we just saw it in Google Earth and, <laughs> and did the research like this. So I think that one of the things is like going deeper again and going further and like not just staying where people say that you have to stay, so going beyond those limits. And also, like we were doing this uh, more qualitative, like map queries and doing these interventions more than only quantitative. And again, <clears throat> we were working on the sociologists 
now the real sociologists came and said, well, uh, can you help us do our job? And we were like, but you're the experts. We're not, we're, we're designers. And I think it was more just like uh, trying to get close to the more the experience than just data. And uh, I think that a lot of people or a lot of sociologists just go more for the data and, okay, how many in the family, what school do you attend? And we were saying, well, okay, tell us where did you give your first kiss? Where did you smoke pot for the first time? And so, them, you know, like you get more engaged with people in that sense. So we're trying to do it in an intuitively way, but also like trying to get people perceive their spaces in another sense and with more, uh, it's more about experience. Um, I think you kind of already touched on this, but when you, like when you're showing the project where you're given basketball court and they said just build a roof, we went beyond that. I'm wondering how do you um, approach a project when you're given a program and then how do you convince the clients of uh, these things you want to go beyond when you're going deeper into a project? Well, in this case, um, it was the developer and he didn't trust what we were going to do. So we said, give us a chance and we will not, we will go just a little over the budget. It was not so much, just a little, but you will get much more if you believe in this. And so he never, he never trust us, but in front of it also like was there and he had to push him to believe that we were doing the correct thing in the, in the project. And so once he saw the benefits of what we have done, then he completely changed his mindset. But it was not until he saw it built, and that was because in front of it had to go also with us to do it, that he could see it. And what we were, were trying to do is that stakeholders or developers can see it before, you know? because if not, it's an impossible task. It's very difficult to do it if they don't see it. So we had to have the, the, the push of Infonavit to help us do it that way. Okay. Oh, oh no, I have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Many questions. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. It was really um, fascinating. I have one comment and a question. So the comment is, I really love the, the projects where you have either where you designed this, the armature for social appropriation, like the earlier playground where you really transformed a site through a minimal implementation. And then even the larger scale projects like the Metropolis or the, the Water Channel project, the, the, the implementation of the architectural elements or the landscapes are actually minimal. You're very much taking, trying to take advantage of the existing system and how it operates and the minimal implementation at the end have a huge impact on the space that then unfolds. It's a gigantic subway system but you chose very wisely only 10 projects within it. So it's a very interesting way of how to manipulate a large scale through smaller implementations. So within your practice I understood that some of the projects are pro bono, others are you're conducting a study like the Metropolis and then you're going to a potential client and others are project where a developer asked you to design a public space. So what is the percentage between direct contracts or ac more academic studies or pro bono work within your practice? Well, <laughs> that's a big problem because we have more pro bono projects <laughs> than the other. No, but we, we do private projects. I, I didn't show some some of the private projects that we do. We do um, houses for private clients and we just finished like 2,000 square meter offices. But um, to sustain the office and sustain the pro bono projects and sustain, we also, I, I also always try to get grants. So the grants help me do research and for us it's vital to do research. So we're all the time looking for grants or like all these 
private projects. Some of them I take them just in order to keep on going with the pro bono or the, the social or research projects. But one of the interesting things is that how can you also translate many of these ideas into the private projects? So for example, these offices, um, they're 2,000 square meter, and um, it, they're in an eight and nine floor of a building where there's no windows. You cannot open the windows, and it has this facade that has this, um, uh, how do you say, aluminio, pardon, este vidrio, uh, vidrio ahumado? Uh, smoke glass. Smoke glass. So if a smoke glass, no windows. So and when we enter, they had this false um, ceiling at two two twenty, with the air conditioning and you know like all the separation glass separations you know as you can see in many offices, and so we said let's take it out and let's see what's underneath. And there it was a beautiful beautiful structure, concrete with these um, lines that you would like to replicate and you would couldn't replicate it now. <laughs> so they were original and we took off. But one of the most important things was that let's open terraces in the eight and ninth floor. So we didn't touch the front facade, but the back facades and the lateral facades could be, because they already had a small window or something. And so we went and we, like it took us a lo lot of time and a lot of, um, we had to convince again the client to open the terraces. And now like it's, you can see completely the, so again, we moved out these barriers, these walls that like you couldn't breathe, you were there and all the people and it's like, uh, how can somebody work here? There's no air. And now with the terraces that we open in both sides, now they have like air, now they have a terrace where they can eat. They, and so they moved because they used to work in a house. And the idea was that how can we, how they didn't want to become, in, in Spanish we call godines. And godines is the, the, the people that work in an office like, you know, like eight hours and go, like very dressing. So they, they, they didn't want to become this in these offices. So how can we change again the perception of a typical office with air conditioning and no windows and when before they were in a house and they're creatives. And so we open the terraces and we fill them with plants. So you feel that you're in a garden in the eighth and ninth floor and we just move walls. We again took these barriers to change the perception of people working in an eight and nine floor. So we try to follow these um, ideas, even if it's a private project. Mm. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about, hey. oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Mir Miravalle, I think it was called, where you had the um, citizens of this city all walk up the volcano together. And I was wondering what feedback you got from them and if there were physical outcomes of that project or if it was kind of just a social mobilization. I want to know what the end of the story was. Sure. I didn't talk about it because it was too long. But no, no, it was really interesting because like at, as simple as it seemed, just walking up the volcano, when we came down, like they realized that they have a volcano. They, they don't have water. Water comes with pipes far away and they cost a lot. So they never buy this type of of bottle of water, obviously. So they fill it with pipes. So we, the idea f for us that they could go up and see what nature resources can give you was that once they turn and saw what they have, this natural resource, we um, converted an underused dome that was there. So we chose this dome that was in the that's in the center of Miravalle and it's underused. And we say, why don't we um, keep the water of, of the rain and rain water and we rec um, recycle it and why don't we become, be, make it become potable? So we use that and they were really, really excited because that was like a pilot project 
we didn't have to do any projects, but we decided we wanted to do a project and we built it. So now we capture the water, the rainwater, and it filters. And with a bicycle machine, they pump it and they get pure water so they can fill their bottles and take it home. And also it's a cafe there, uh, where a diner where a lot of people go and eat and they have potable water that they drink like different type of uh, Jamaica water or lemon water. But now it's the water that they take out of the, of, of the, of the dome. So this was a prototype to, that it can be um, in a larger scale. Like if people start capturing uh, rainwater in all the ceilings, and then maybe they can they can be auto sustainable. In it. that's the ideal in the, the future, because then if they capture all the water, then then they have to bring pipes that cost a lot. So it was really interesting that this uh, volcano walk came out with uh, underused dome collecting rainwater. <laughs> you can hear me. Um, hi, sorry. Uh, but how has your um, perspective on the manifesto changed or evolved since you were an undergraduate student and to now as like a, or a grad student, I guess, to now as a pioneer? Um, well, the manifesto was just made <laughs> some months ago. <laughs> Uh, no, so, so for, of course you change, no, it has changed a lot. But the, I, um, this manifesto was done just um, like, you know, for the book that I'm going to give two samples to Samantha so we can put one where the exhibition is and then you can have a look at it. But uh, obviously we, we change all the time in the process. But what I was saying to the students also, it was that the essence persists and the essence of what we believe and it's consistent, it has to go all the way on always, right? So. Thank you. No, thank you.